Hello, my name is Jackson and I am the founder and CEO of Edily. We are a learning app that's kind of like TikTok meets Khan Academy. And thanks for joining us and welcome to the very first episode of Entrepreneur Tips, where we pack our episodes full of entrepreneurial stories and lessons from awesome builders. And today we have the pleasure of having Kelly Cure with us. Kelly is the co-founder and head of growth at Skillfully or skillful.ly. And Skillfully is a skill building platform and hiring platform where candidates can join to not just look for a job, but also build those skills required to land their dream job and show that they are the right fit for the companies out there. So let's kind of start by learning a little bit more about you, Kelly, first. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you came to start Skillfully? Yeah, super happy to and such a pleasure to be with you today. We've had the chance to get to know each other over the past year after the ASU GSB conference, so Mm -hmm. it's such a pleasure to be with you. (laughs) By the way, we're in the Elite 200 this year, so we'll be joining you for that. Amazing. Congrats. That's that's wonderful. We were joking, like, is there a Lifetime Achievement Award for getting it? I can't remember how many years we've, <laughs> we've been in it. Really <laughs> I know. Cool. You were in it last year, and I think the year before, right? I think so, too. Yeah. It's always an honor, though. Like, the ASU GSB is just such a cool partnership and conference and I always have a great experience there. So yeah, I can share a little bit about about my background. I was always a really creative person, but started my career off in management consulting and then um, had the chance through that experience to just roll my sleeves up, do many, many different roles all within one and ultimately realize what I really wanted to do, which was consulting more around mission aligned work and and impact consulting and eventually spun off after kind of living around the world, getting a chance to see a lot of different things, knew that I wanted to live in a developing country and move to Africa for four years and had the chance there to spin off my own consulting business, start working in mission driven work and using my skills that way and start a company which was a small forestry business completely different than skillfully but it did give me the chance to see what it takes to start a business from the ground up to fund that business to become profitable um, and most importantly to hire so that's where the idea for skillfully came from i had the chance to build my own company for the first time and in so doing realizing how critical it was to hire the right people And I realized that I was my own worst enemy when I just looked at a resume and hired somebody based on resume, or if I just looked at their academic background and just hired them based on that and started experimenting with skills-based hiring and brought in some of the most transformational team members that I've ever had in my life and that I'd had to date in building that business who had zero academic experience, but who had all the skills. And that experience of transforming the success of the first business and really, yeah, just seeing how much finding the right team member and how resumes And kind of like a LinkedIn profile was not leading me to the right team members at a really critical time for my business was such an impactful experience. I just got curious about did the big companies like I used to work for in my early career also want to hire like this? Were people in the U.S. also interested in this? Um, At this point, I've been abroad for seven years and moved back to the U.S. and tested my hand out at an MBA as a chance to explore was this idea viable? And I just use it as a chance like if this idea was viable then people would want to join my team if it was viable people would want to give me grant funding which happened in the early days and people would want to you know share their expertise or wisdom with me so I had no attachment to the idea but a lot of excitement around it and started yeah started off started building the business from day one of the MBA and just was super fortunate to be surrounded by Um, brilliant people on and off the campus in the Bay Area and have great partnerships, great mentors in the early days and meet my, eventually meet my co-founders and we merged our businesses after one year. So that was also a blessing in disguise was finding co-founders who were also already obsessed with the same problem I was and had separately started their business. So there wasn't that 
pain of trying to get somebody else super excited about the idea, we were naturally already bought in on it together. And then we've been off to the races ever since. So that's a little bit about the background to kick us off. Yeah, that is so awesome, Kelly. Was there like a single moment when you felt like you had this this idea that, hey, I want to go into entrepreneurship, I want to actually start something? Or was it a series of things? Like, was there a moment that stuck out in your mind? I'm curious to ask about that. That's a good question. I don't think there was a moment that where I decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur. There was definitely a moment where I just knew... I looked at my life. I was living in London at the time, working for a big consulting company. And I just knew that for so long I hadn't been fulfilled in my career. And I was finding so many other ways to give back and do mission aligned work and volunteer. And I just thought, I'm not aligning my curiosity with how I'm spending my day. I'm not aligning my, you know, what sets my heart on fire with how I'm spending my day. And I need to change that immediately. But from the moment of deciding that until, you know, quitting my job, moving to Africa, getting the chance to start my first a consulting business, then an entrepre- then go on my entrepreneurial journey, um, that wasn't a quick process that it just in and of itself was a year. And then to ending up building skillfully was many years. So I think oftentimes the narrative out there is, you know, if you're not a coder who's 22 going through YC, then you probably might as well give up and and find another path. But I just completely disagree. I think we are, each one of us are made up of the fabric of our experiences throughout life. And the more that we, I, one of my number one alignment moments that I, I guess, or pieces of advice that I give to other entrepreneurs or to other people out there who are a little bit lost on their journey is just to follow your curiosity. The worst thing Mm -hmm. that you'll do is have a blast and realize it's a dead end, but you will have followed something. You will put your curiosity to bed or you will keep chasing that and you'll just be hard on fire, which is like exactly what we all deserve. We deserve to feel motivated and plugged in. And That's not to say that we shouldn't have some bad jobs along the way. I think doing the grunt work and the really unsexy work is part of a great journey. And that is what it is to be an entrepreneur, showing up every day and just doing the work one day longer than the company who gave up yesterday. That's what it's all about. So yeah, that's what comes to mind when you ask that. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. And it sounds like you got some cool opportunities to travel the world as well. That's awesome. From, From London to Africa to the U.S., that is fantastic. Cool. Couple other stops in there that we can talk about over coffee sometime. Yeah, it's been a windy <laughs> journey. <laughs> yes, yes. But thank you for for sharing a little bit of your story. So I guess the the format that we're working on with this sort of podcast slash experience slash maybe a couple TikToks in there as well is that we have a number of different topic areas that we're going to be covering. So over the course of this conversation, we're going to go through four entrepreneurship topics, topics that you specifically were thinking were really interesting that you want to share a couple of stories about. And so our four topic areas for today are partnerships, co-founders, of course, for skillfully hiring, and then would love to talk a little bit about growth as well. So diving right on in, let's talk a little bit about partnerships. And so partnerships can be a number of different things. And you know, even when I'm thinking in my mind about what partnerships means, there's a few different categories of partnerships that you can have. Can you quickly explain like the general idea of how you think of partnerships and what they are, what should they do for a company and a startup, and what goals you set for them? I think at the end of the day, the best type of partnership is one that both parties are a little bit better by doing that partnership. I mean, it's like a partnership in life. That's you know how I think about my relationships. It's like, is am I able to bring something to this person's life? Are they also able to bring something to my life? And are we better? Is, is the sum of our parts greater? And if we took the parts apart, I think in the early days, it can be such an accelerator for young businesses. And I think it's such a fine balance of staying focused enough to get your research done and do your background work, balancing that with getting out of the building and talking to other people who are working in the same area and finding points where 
I think being super clear on maybe where some of your weaker areas are, which can either be like weaker from a skill set or weaker from I hate doing this. Like I definitely had those areas and bringing in partnership in the early day can be team members just to join your team. So I brought in in early days, like people that could code, people that loved being on financials, who could build that part of the business for me. Uh, or it can be partners that do something slightly different than you, but it brings something to accelerate your business while you do it at the same time for them. Um, mm. And that can either, I think in the early days, it's it's great not to jump into bed with somebody without knowing them and mm -hmm. you try it before you buy it. So before, I don't think there's any reason to like immediately merge your business with somebody or immediately start partnering with somebody without a trial first. And that's very common in entrepreneurship now. It's very common to have a co-founder trial, very common trial, a partnership out and see, you know, do a week long sprint with the, with the partner organization to see if you guys are running at the same speed and see what they deliver at the end of a week. Um, but for me in early days, it was really important. And also sometimes keeping your antennas up for opportunities that might not be textbook exactly what you were looking for, but it's such a great opportunity to allow you to do an experiment. And that's what that's what allowed me to to move forward quicker in the early days was if I had been like pretty close minded, like, no, I'm just going to stick to building this exact product that I had in mind. I wouldn't have had a great opportunity to do a wild experiment with 100 users. So I was approached by another, by a partner who was like, this is an interesting example. They were an academic institution. They were a research organization within an academic institution. They said, could we do a pilot? And it was fantastic because we had a structure. I had resources. I had a brand name um, through Cal Berkeley on my pilot. And I had a hundred users overnight. So little things like that where you're, you keep your, you stay in your lane enough where you can stay focused and realize what your strengths and weaknesses are and where you might benefit from a partner, but then also staying open-minded enough if you get a great opportunity not to say no too quickly. And most of that, I think, comes from being super clear on your goals and milestones and then trusting your intuition, sometimes more than logic, which is a key and a real muscle that I think it's really good to, to flex, which is sometimes why entrepreneurs a little bit later in their career are more successful than super, super early stage entrepreneurs because it does take a little bit of intuition along the way. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So we heard a little bit about make sure those partnerships are mutually beneficial. We heard stay mm -hmm. open to sort of some of the unlikely, I had this vision in mind, but maybe there's another version of what we could do. What tips would you have for entrepreneurs out there who are trying to make a partnership happen? Like how should they approach that, that conversation with a potential business partner, someone who could be mutually beneficial mm -hmm. for them? I think it's interesting to think of it from two sides. So if they're approaching the partner being like radically empathetic, to what their needs are and what am I doing to help them instead of sometimes our tendency, we are so obsessed with our new baby. We just want to talk about the new baby, but coming at it instead with the lens of how can I help them? How am I helping them in understanding, doing the background research of what their problems might be? The more specific you can be on what problems you're going to help them solve, the more background work you can do, especially if it's a bigger elephant sized partner and your little ants, um, that can be impressive. <laughs> and also just think about how many partners approach this, this organization already. How can I stand out? Um, how can I approach them with a little bit more knowledge about their needs maybe than the next person did? The other side of it is if you're being approached by somebody, it, there will be a lot of people, right? Like, the second you start talking about an idea, there's going to be a lot of distractions. So I think there's so many decisions. This is why entrepreneurship, you learn so much in building a business because you have to make so many decisions on the fly. And there are so many shiny objects, so many <laughs> squirrels out there that can be really distracting. And this is where a co-founder helps. This is where advisors help. And this is where re staying rigorous to like, what are my goals and like first principles is really 
critical just not to get distracted by the shiny objects but be ready to pounce when it is a good opportunity yeah. we use it just to be really practical and to give a specific example on one of our most transformational partnerships so in the early days we were looking to partner with academic institutions so universities community colleges and we had some connections and some experience working with the city university of new york which is a consortium of 25 campuses in new york it's new york city's public school system and what now in hindsight, looking back on what worked, because they are one of our biggest partners now, and that was huge, not having to pick off each one of the 25 campuses, but to have a partnership at the top, was I went in very rogue grassroots at the bottom level with single professors in the classroom and started to get grassroots pilots up and running, did very hands-on, very unscalable, very impractical, but really sort of like hands in the mud, really glove service for the students, for the professors, and learned more about the needs of the school that way. And so when I did get the meetings at the very top, I said, I'm already working with John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'm in their classroom. And they were like, well, these are the types of stories we want to tell our bosses. This is great. Um, so I think they're, what I've seen, and I've seen this happen a couple of times with us, is having like a top-down and bottom-up strategy at the same time when you're approaching a bigger partner to be like, oh, I'm already working with your head of sales in this capacity on a white paper while you're talking to the CTO or the CHRO um, about maybe a bigger partnership with the organization. So kind of experimenting at different levels, different spheres of influence can be can be interesting and it's i guess it comes back to the empathy thing of like what is the motivation of that person at the top of the decision maker a lot of times they want a great story to tell they want data they want you know humans to connect the impact to and you'll get that oftentimes by having more grassroots often impractical and scalable very very valuable really rich pilots and i'm a huge fan of piloting that's also a great way to get people to say yes and take the edge off of a new partnership is to say, no problem. Let's do a quick pilot. No cost mm. to you. Like how much, you know, think about the work that you can take off their plate. Yeah. That's been another little, a little trick that we've used over the years too. That's awesome. So it got me thinking with white glove service and these sort of small moments that are unscalable. What's maybe one of the most mm -hmm. kind of out there things that someone's requested <laughs> that you, you like had to help them out with? Oh, that's such a good question. Just in that in that same pilot, just in the early days, getting on the phone with individual users and supporting individuals on, you know, young entrepreneurs who want to show me a business plan as part of their class, um, you know, actually making time for those calls and saying, you're my future user. Of course, I have time for that. Of course, I want to learn from you and spend 30 minutes getting inside your brain. Mm. Um so I did a lot of that in the early days, talking to individual users, even at the same time that I'm trying to sell, you know, to huge universities and to get big elephants in, staying connected at the at the grassroots level is super important. Yeah, that's so important. Literally going down to the root, it's like the opposite of the lose the forest for the trees, right? It's like, don't lose the roots for right. the forest, right? It's a great <laughs> analogy. I love a forest. Yeah. That's my language. Awesome. So yeah, thanks so much. I think really interesting about partnerships. Now I want to go back a little bit, you know, you were hinting earlier about your co-founder story. So I would love to ask you, how do you think about the concept of co-founders versus employees, yeah. for example, and who should a co-founder be to you? Yeah, that's a great point. I think of everybody on my team as my team member at the end of the day. And one thing I wish I would have done when I first started the company before I met my now co-founders was not call anybody a co-founder hmm. and just call everybody just flat hierarchy. Nobody's a co-founder. We're all just working on this project together. I think co-founder, I call it co-founder dating or testing out working with a co-founder, which now is like completely normal. But at the time I knew nothing of any of this is, is really best practice. And at the end of the day, just really understanding what your co-founder's motivations are what in that's okay at least for me very much okay if their motivations are completely different than mine but i want to know what their motivations are to know 
A, am I super comfortable with that? And B, that I know how to incentivize you, that I know how to cheer you on. Um, so I think it like just blanket advice, if I have to say something is don't, don't call anybody a co-founder right away. Date them, get to know them, work on a project together, see how they treat other people, understand how they managed people before. That's a huge impact on the business. And some people are natural, great managers. Some people need a lot of coaching. So to be really razor sharp on your co-founder's strengths and weaknesses and understand their motivations and just spend time with them because you're going to spend so much time with them. And not everybody has to be friends with their co-founders. Not everybody needs a co-founder. I know plenty of very happy solo founders out there. That wasn't for me. I'm a pack animal. I definitely needed co-founders and wanted them. That makes it worth it for me. But it also complicates things at the end of the day. You don't just have veto power over everything. So whether it's co-founders or team members, I'm really clear on my weaknesses and my blind spots and also what I don't want to do. Like I mentioned earlier, like financial statements, I will pay anything to not have to do that. And I have a co-founder who is absolutely brilliant at it. I don't know how to code. I have a co-founder who is brilliant at the technical side of things. So just, I think getting to know them, understanding their motivation, we've, we got particularly lucky where we are a tripod who are completely different skill sets, completely different people, and we have so much fun working together. So we're, we're super lucky. We also have plenty of conflict and there's a lot of great resources out there on how to work through co-founder conflict. There's frameworks, there's books, there's coaches, all of which I'm happy to recommend resources for. I've used them all. I'm a fan of not reinventing the wheel and I'm a fan of having a lot of advisors who are not my co-founders close. I call it, I call it founder therapy, having other founders around me who <laughs> are hustling, who are going the same pain and excitement, but they're not my co-founders. It, it's, it is a form of therapy. But same for building my team. I tend to surround myself with people who are very different than me because we balance each other out and we support each other's strengths and weaknesses. And that's uh, that's been a key to my success. But I really like to understand what are my team members' motivations and what is their approach how are they going to treat other team members? And that's been huge in building our culture and nurturing our culture to where it is today, which is where it's always been. And that's kind of our non-negotiable at Skillfully is protecting our culture is, is number one because it's been our, our secret sauce and recipe for success so far. Yeah, that's wonderful. And so I'm, I'm a little bit curious about like, why specifically the the title of co-founder where you where you think of it as like not necessarily thinking of it as the title of co-founder versus team can you maybe go into right. a little bit about like why why that is specifically sorry tell me one more time can you rephrase it i want to be sure i answer it correctly yeah so i think you mentioned that you know i I don't necessarily want to think of you know someone as a co-founder and i'm not sure if the if the you know the co-founder title oh. is what I want to you know use, I think of everyone as a team member. So I'm curious about like what like what goes into that framing. Yes, I totally see what you mean, and I might have slightly overstated that. What I what I have two co-founders. They are they play a different role than the rest of my team, but at the end of the day, I guess my point was more on the team member side is I don't think of my team members as employees. Mm. They, many of them be in the company, they are my right hand people and my utmost priority, just like my co-founders are. Um, so that's kind of where that thought came from. And I think the difference between co-founder and in team a little bit is just, yeah, just the level of rigor. I took three months to get to know my co-founders before I decided to merge businesses and co-found with them. Whereas with a team member, I'm making that decision over the course of like a week or, or two weeks. But at the end of the day, I maybe I spend more time with my co-founders. They have, you know, that we make the biggest decisions together, but the way that we've chosen to do it at Skillfully is like even our quote unquote interns are our team members and they have just as much voice in a meeting as my co-founders do. So we really try to really try like our biggest 
onboarding points that we make to new people is we've brought you in here because you have a voice that we're super excited to hear and in no way do we want you to take orders from us we want you to give us orders you we want you to push back on what we're doing like please bring your own voice and we try to live that out in our in the way that we run meetings and that we collaborate and work together it's so awesome. much more valuable than just being in our own resonance chamber of the three of us yeah do you have any tips on who not to work with as a co-founder yeah like any ethical spidey senses uh that you have are worth chasing down, like worth giving the person the benefit of the doubt and discussing and leaning into with curiosity instead of concern. But that's a 100% non-negotiable for me. If my co-founders weren't aligned in serving our learner first and founding skillfully as a public benefit corporation, um, or if there were any ethical qualms, in especially in the early days, what is it going to be like on a hard day? So anything around that. And then I only have one rule in life and that's be kind. And if I, if I ever saw some, one of my co-founders not treating anybody, doesn't matter who it is. doesn't matter if it's a VC that's being incredibly rude or a customer who's being incredibly rude. It like literally doesn't matter who, what, when, where that would be a huge non-negotiable because we're representing our, we're not just representing each other as co-founders, we're representing our users and our yeah. university. Anybody not to work with. I think that's my only pretty wide birth of anybody that I want to work with. Um, great. I love ethical spidey senses, by the way. I love that as a, <laughs> as a phrase. It's a little bit of a joke with my team. My co-founders say they trust my spidey sense, which <laughs> is a really like a funny way of saying, sometimes there's not a lot of logic behind a feeling that I have but I say it anyway and they've they've always really respected that to the point where now they joke and they say okay if it's your spidey sense we're going with it which is like a way that I feel very appreciated by my co-founders and um yeah I I, do, I think sometimes in our world, like ration and logic and data runs the show. There's a higher, there's another form of intelligence, kind of similar to what Malcolm Gladwell writes about and other philosophers and scholars and neuroscientists write about. And in this like data-driven age, algorithms win. There's also another thing out there. And that's why I also like joke, but seriously bring up the spidey sense. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So Kelly, you have two co-founders, right? Brett, who's the CEO, and Johnson, your head of product. I think I've, I've met both of them and both seem like awesome people. But I'm super curious about your story of, of how you met them, how you decided to merge companies, it sounds like. So can you tell me a little bit about that that story and also maybe some of the things that make them good, good co-founders? It sounds like that overlap in skills, but I'll, I'll let you tell it. Yeah, thanks for asking. It's a wild story. Three days before, no, two days before lockdown pandemic, I met them. Oh, wow. Johnson, I had been in a class with. Yeah, Johnson was <laughs> auditing a class. He wasn't even in the MBA program. He was just the smart kid sitting in the back. And I always was turning around. I was sitting in the front row. He was sitting in the back row. I was always turning around to listen to his mic drop questions when the whole room would just go silent. And he just asked such thoughtful and intentional questions, even without knowing him. I had so much respect for him. And we just bought, we, the three of us happened to be over at a mutual friend's house two days before lockdown. And it was a Saturday night. We were both completely nerdily working on our startups at a friend's house together. And they were whiteboarding in the other room. I was doing calls in the other room. And we just heard what each other were working on and just thought, hmm, that's, at the time, I just thought, that's interesting. I have a lot of questions. And they saw, they thought the same thing. And there was also like a vibe that I could feel a room going on that I was like, oh, I really like, I like their energy. And they seem very motivated. They mm. seem to be like sprinting on this at the same speed that I am. 
which is hard to find. And I think is also really important side note in finding your co-founders, people that are running at the same speed as you. And that was a couple days before lockdown. Lockdown happened and we both kept working separately in our silos. And at a point, Brett, the CEO contacted me after a bunch of LinkedIn posting I was doing about some of the pilots I was running. And he just said, please, can we hop on a call? I think we're working on the same thing. And from the second that we hopped on the call, he was already selling me on <laughs> merging the companies. What role did I want to play in the company? And I was completely in the opposite camp. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I want to test you. I want to get to know you. I want to meet you in person more. Mm. Yeah, this I, is my baby that I'm like, building right now. <laughs> exactly. And I, and I looked at where we were both at and we were working on complex complementary pieces of the problem. Brett and Johnson were working diligently, rigorously on product, and I was working on user pilots. I And I had a great partnership with another organization going at that point. They were crushing it and had amazing advisors from the university with them. And I just said, I think we're going to be stronger if we take three months and sprint and see how far the other person gets as we get to know each other, as we have coffee chats all masked up outside, but getting to know each other. And at the end of the three months, Brett finally said like, you need to make your decision now. Like we are, we need to, I need to know, like, are you going to go forward with us? And then we, we decided to merge because I was super impressed with how far they had gotten. Um, I had so much, I also felt like I could contribute a ton to the space that I was plugging into and growth. I didn't want to be the CEO anymore. I'd been, I was the CEO before and I was really happy to, mm to not have that role and just to focus more on users and growth and people and team building. So it was just like kind of, it was a really hard decision in the moment because I was extremely burnt out, uh, which is which is something yeah. that we should probably cover in the entrepreneurship <laughs> chapter at some point. Yes, um, 100%. I'm sure you, but I'm, I made the leap in from day one when we started working together. It was just, I just felt like very fortunate to have that chemistry with them and to have such mutual respect like such mutual respect and curiosity about each other and to have such three different backgrounds, three different skill sets, just a similar approach to life, a lot of humor, a lot of laughter. And we just aligned from day one that we wanted to take care of our users first. And that was it. And that like none of those things have changed. So a lot of parallels to getting married. I haven't been married, but uh, here it's like, very much like this, just really understanding who you're going to spend every day with. So yeah, that's a little bit of our founder backstory. Yeah, that's a great story. And 100%, I, I totally get the idea of founder dating leading into like, in fact, I've even had moments of like founder flirting where I thought I was going to like DM this person on Twitter, yeah. or they DM me. And I was like, Oh, are they gonna, you know, join my company? I don't know. And then you know, maybe it doesn't work out or yeah. Maybe it does. And so I, I, I love the analogy and it definitely takes a long time to get there. But if you find that right person, it's it's super worth it because for me, I'd, I definitely would not have made it as far as I have because of the burnout quotient without a co-founder. Right. It's just so nice to have somebody in the trenches with you. Um, mm -hmm. And at the same time, you don't have to, I don't have to rush it. If you're a solo founder, out there, there, there's also nothing wrong with that. And you can also get that fulfillment from amazing advisors, amazing team members. But again, for me, and if you're probably feeling the same thing, there's just nothing like having co-founders and in, in, who are literally in the same boat as you, like rowing along. So I feel you. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And that does bring us to the next part of the equation, which is how do you bring new people into your boat, so to speak, and that is hiring. So hiring is something that any business owner would eventually have to do if you want to scale up your business. And obviously for you at Skillfully, it, you know, it's something that you think about a ton because it's such a core part of your platform. So I'm curious to ask what, what process do most companies use to hire? And does that process change at all for some of, you know, the, the best companies, for example? Yes, it is. It's so interesting that there's an, actually not a formula that most companies hire. I think today there is maybe more of like a three or four step process that involves um, like some light information sharing or vetting or an algorithm does that or, you know, a, 
a bot does the first step, then there's usually some sort of like a, a test that, mm. that our learners are having to complete. So on our platform, we have them doing some of these cognitive tests ahead of time because they are uncomfortable and it's really good to get comfortable being uncomfortable before you're in the interview process. So then there's usually some sort of like a, a cognitive aptitude test that they're going through. And it's still old school. It's interview questions from a recruiter and then usually a couple rounds from people within the business. Um, that's like a, a, a light framework, but there's, it's interesting how little rigor there is and that a lot of the upfront selection, if they're not using skillfully is done by a negative selection bias algorithm, um, mm. which basically just means, do you or don't you have these buzzwords that I'm looking for on, on your resume or on your profile? Um, so yeah, you like what we try to get employers to open their minds to is in the same amount of time that you're reviewing a resume, you could re be reviewing such richer data than just this veneer that sits on a resume on a learner. And by having such strong negative selection bias and a lot of the hiring tools in their algorithms, if you had a career gap, buy. If you don't have these buzzwords or you don't have, you know, XYZ programming language or past company goodbye. And you just miss out so much on such an interesting pool of applicants out there. What we do try to do is be a parallel track for employers to bring more diversity across every sense of that word into their hiring pipeline by not using just a negative selection bias algorithm, but by working with us who partner with Organizations that have non-degree learners, organizations that have army vets, organizations that support community college students, community colleges, associate's degree learners. So, and, and within four-year degree students or schools, sometimes working with their school professional studies and sometimes working with their business school. So it's a full range of, of partnerships that we have where we recruit our learners from. And through that, employers are meeting net new learners that they wouldn't have met otherwise. And that's the exciting thing for a lot of our employers more and more is it's all a competition. It's a race for talent. The talent market is really tight. It's a super interesting market to be operating in right now. And they see a lot of value in working with us who use a completely different way of evaluating learners just based on their skills and validating that they have the minimum viable skills for that job and bringing them into the fold. And so by doing so, they're welcoming in learners who are equally as qualified as sort of their four-year Ivy League degree counterparts, but oftentimes they're shoved to the margins just based on a sheer algorithm or based on less resources. So we just try to center all of the learners who oftentimes get marginalized, who are equally as qualified and bring them to the forefront. And that's been a great experience for our employer partners to start hiring two-year degree learners, to start bringing more army vets into their folds and having really great experiences with it. So that's sort of the, the skillfully methodology and, and the why we exist is just to bring the overlooked majority of phenomenal candidates into the, into the limelight. So it sounds like the, the process changes rather than just, you know, having a, let's say a resume and a couple of interviews, all of a sudden you're getting this new data point around this candidate's skills. Yes. And so Skillfully is obviously yes. a platform that shows you like the, the insight into that skill window. And you know, if they weren't using Skillfully, they would have to find some other way to either the skills that that you know, individual is gonna bring to the table or, or something along those lines to improve the process of hiring. Yeah. Oftentimes it's opaque truly what the requirements for the job are. And oftentimes there's an element of culture fit in there. So there's just a ton of biases that can creep in as well that we try to help mitigate. So yeah, you're, you did a really great job summarizing. Yeah. And so I would love to also like re-summarize here. Like, what do you think are the top principles for successful hiring? If you were to say like, these are the, I don't know if it's four, or if it's seven, but these are the principles for hiring. And then what mistakes do you see with hiring that people who want to hire better should avoid? Those are great questions. I think first and foremost is motivation. 
finding a way to understand what is this learner motivated for this job? Is this learner motivated in general and like willingness to learn? I think those are the, the top two. And then one that I hear very often from employers is storytelling. So not just regurgitating data or sticking to the facts, but telling the why behind it and storytelling the whole picture, speaking to stakeholders, bringing the everybody example. in, bringing in current events. And that's like the, that's the cherry on top. That's like, if you can, if you can story tell, especially for entry level jobs, that is a, a lifelong skill. So that we do a lot of those more durable or softer skill with our learners as well on the platform. And then at the end of the day, it's relationships, relationships, relationships. So teamwork, collaboration, communication is, is bar none. And so again, that's what we bake a lot of that into the platform as well. We have learners take the Enneagram um, because it. that's a really deep way of understanding my communication styles and then how I communicate with other people. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. At some point I took an Enneagram in the past. What are the, what, do you know what your Enneagram is? It's like numbers, right? Yes. Yes. It's numbers. I'm an eight. I'm a Mavram, nice. which is like very stereotypical. <laughs> yeah. You know what oh, you God, are? I think I, I, I'm, I'm completely forgetting everything about Enneagram right now. But if I remember okay. the number right, it was a seven. Do you remember? Yeah, you're an enthusiast. Yes. I can see that. Yep. I love that you say yeah. you can see it in me. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I can see it in you. Yes, you should take it again skillfully because it's super, it's a, it's an amazing, amazing, powerful tool. I have a seven wing. Yes, Game the wings. Game. Seven recognized seven. Yep, yep. Love yep. that. <laughs> wings. <laughs> awesome. There could be a whole nother interview on Enneagrams and, and other personality tests. So good yeah, but uh, awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about for skillfully specifically, you know, how many, how many employees have you all had the opportunity to hire? And maybe can you tell me, let's say a, a story of a time where you hired well and, and what went well with that? And maybe a story of a time that didn't go so well. And what was the thing that you think went wrong there? Yeah, absolutely. So we are a small but mighty team. We have five full time right now, and we're in the process of bringing on two more, hopefully in the next couple of months. So we'll be seven, but we have a team of about 12. We have a lot of part time team members, and then a team of advisors too. So we're, we're a small army, a small peaceful army, but, but five full time. We've used a really rigorous process to bring people on board because we have to take our own medicine and we have to practice what we preach and it's been laborious and an intensive process and 1000% worth it because we have brought on phenomenal people. We just had our first on-site team retreat two oh, weeks ago it. and getting investing in bringing everybody together at Shack yeah. 15 where you've been before a great co-working Shout space out San in Francisco. the Bay Area and getting everybody Shaq, yeah, exactly. Shout out, shout out Shaq. It, it was a phenomenal experience. It was surreal. It was a pinch myself moment of seeing the room of brilliant, driven, kind people that we have who have all come together to work on skillfully. And I think that's a testament to a super intentional hiring practice. Um, okay, one specific story. So I just hired somebody on my team, our head of operations. Her name's Eileen Dominic. Shout out Eileen. And the hiring process for Eileen took about five months, which is not, not advisable. Okay. That's probably an exaggeration. Maybe three, three to four months. My team was exhausted with the work. They really needed somebody, but we just weren't, we weren't exactly hitting the nail on the head and finding the right person. And we went through, we went through about 600 applicants. Wow. I'm not exaggerating, not interviewing all of them actually, but I said eyes on about 600 resumes with my team members, with my co-founders and went through about six final rounds and ended up with Eileen. Honestly, at the end of the day, trusting my spidey sense, I just had a feeling that Eileen woke up in the morning eating, breathing and sleeping operations. Her brain was a natural operations brain and that she would be a great counterpart to me who is much more visionary, creative artist brain. And it's been a, it's been a fantastic experience, but it was difficult making the decision between Eileen and some other candidates that were also phenomenal and that that were preferred by other co-founders at certain times. So it was really 
a great experience to know that at the end of the day we all came together but and it's worth it to find the right person at the end of the day and one of my team members who was impacted the most by not having somebody in Eileen's role at the all hands just said to me I know you made the right decision now and I'm glad you waited and at the time she was just completely underwater so that was I was not expecting to hear that I was really happy to hear that so it's worth it it's worth it to find the right person and how about do you have any stories of of you know employees that haven't worked out whether at skillfully or another company yeah not with skillfully but this was part of my impetus for starting skillfully was just based on the first company that I was working on mm. in Africa my I was yeah, I was sort of given a couple of team members by the funders and they were part of the reason when I looked at their resume, when I looked at their background, they were textbook perfect candidates for the job. Perfect, like studied exactly forestry, perfect candidate, great public speaker, everything on paper and nothing in practice. And that was part of my impetus for saying, wow, I really need to hire differently. It's not fun firing somebody, especially in another country where in the US it's much easier. It's at will employment in other countries. You have to go through really intense processes to fire somebody. And it's just, a, it's emotionally not cool, not fun to have to do. So if you are also gifted employees by, by a funder, I would also, vet those employees equally as to, to other team members and ultimately I'm super grateful for that experience and it did end up working out. I brought that person on as an advisor after a couple of months but it's, it was one of the toughest experiences that I've had so far and it also led me to start skillfully so you never know when one of those like walking through the fire moments leads to something great. Yeah wow that's I mean firing is something Frankly, I've never had to deal with yet, but I, you know, have had some of those almost a co-founder didn't quite work out and that alone was painful. Yeah. So I, I, I can only imagine how important it is to get this decision right and, and definitely not to rush it. Yes, I think that you nailed it. Not rushing it is the key, even when you're under immense pressure, especially when you're under immense pressure. My grandma would say that. She was like, when you have no time, when you're rushed, that's when you need to slow down. Yes. And I, yeah, I'm not good at that. And it's very wise. Our next topic area that I wanted to talk a little bit about is growth. So can you maybe talk a little bit about customer acquisition and growth as a field and how someone like you as head of growth is bringing on customers and how that might be different from say a head of marketing for example the way that we have it structured is our we have users on one side we're two-sided marketplace and then customers on the other side who are the employers and then we have learner partners who are our universities we've chosen based on what's worked and based on not wanting to spend on advertising yet We've chosen to grow organically through university partners who do our advertising for us. Students trust the universities. The universities are getting a benefit from students using us. And in the early days, we thought we're never going to charge learners. We're never going to charge universities. They're just doing free marketing for us. They're our partners and we're just going to charge employers. And that has by and large been our acquisition strategy for users and it's worked great. I, as head of growth, am excited for a day where we do start leaning into advertising and paid marketing. I think that will be a really, really cool to see what happens. We haven't ever paid for an mm -hmm. ad on Facebook or Instagram, never paid for an ad anywhere. So it's, it's a fun faucet that will be exciting to turn on someday. But what we've done so far is grow through grow with the type of learners that we know we want to serve and grow with the type of institutions and partners that we know we want to serve and learned a ton that way and we haven't spent anything and we also realized over time that there was a willingness to pay from universities that we hadn't expected so core business model is still customer acquisition coming from employer partners user acquisition coming through universities. I guess the biggest thing on both sides, because it has been, it is tough to sometimes balance your supply and demand in a two-sided marketplace, but we've tried to and succeeded in not just picking off one employer here and one university here. We've gone for consortiums of both, and that's been great for us. And it was kind of the same strategy with both, like working with individual companies in New York and working with individual schools in New York and then selling up to or 
partnering up to the top level where on the employer side, we work with a consortium of employers that JP Morgan started called the New York CEO Jobs Console. And on the user side, we work with the City University of New York 25 campuses. Mm. So trying that has been our scaling mechanism. And the the big question for me on a day to day basis is, you know, going deeper with partners that we already have, because within a school, within a university system, there's so many directions you can go versus making sure I have the same thing standing up in California and Texas and Chicago. So we're doing a happy balance of, of both right now. And it's a mixture of cold outreach, warm relationships, warm connections, and just trying to, over time, fill in beside me and under me team members who can help scale my efforts. And we've gotten so much smarter on what's our playbook for approaching university partners, what's our playbook for approaching customers, and so we can scale that and kind of in divide and conquer. Wonderful. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And you mentioned... You know, maybe getting into ads at some point versus what is a very sort of B2B sales cycle. So given that you're a marketplace with these two sides, how do you think about the difference between B2C and B2B growth? Yeah, we've been largely B2B. The the B2C, I guess, is the would be like the charging our user. So like selling directly to individual users. I think that's something that we've explored a little bit, and I think that would come more with paid advertising and marketing out there. But right now, our goal is as much as possible not to charge, not to be, not to have cost be a preventative item for learners to use us. So that's kind of the delicate line that we're walking. What we have found was we tested last year charging learners for the first time and we gave them an option. You either write an essay, so you're paying for mm. your time, you're putting skin in the game writing an essay, or you're mm. paying a small fee, which was like $8 a month, like two cups of coffee. And that was one of the coolest experiments that we've run because we realized we got so much more engaged learners and our numbers didn't drop, but it did weed out some learners who were just there for like a quick, easy fixed, almost for like a video game style experience. And that's not who's going to be a great employee for us at the end of the day, most of the time. So it was like, we've tested out the B2C and we're doing it on a small scale. I think like 15% of our learners decide to pay instead of write an essay. And those are all just learners that don't come from a partner already because partners don't have to pay. So it's been mostly B2B and that's been pretty successful. I'm excited to just grow and experiment with every type of growth in the future, but I don't see that being like something that we test out maybe in the next two quarters, maybe like end of next awesome. year or end of this year. Cool. So last, last question here on growth. Can you maybe share a, a quick case study for skillfully of your biggest win in customer acquisition and what you did well and how it happened? Yeah, I... I think it was winning the New York CEO Jobs Council, which is 30 of New York's biggest employers. Started by JP Morgan during the pandemic as a way to bring more diverse applicants and hire the average New Yorker into some of the best companies in the world. That was a long courtship. Like, I don't know if you've seen the meme of a sales cycle of having like some elephants, some gazelles, some like rabbits, and then some ants in the mix. And I firmly believe in that, of having some giant customers and some tiny customers, some tiny customers that you can just invoice a little bit of money, keep the door open, and some who you're going to chase over the course of a year. So with the New York CEO Jobs Council, we just made it our biggest priority to get a pilot up and running with some of those employers and to find an advocate within the council who would trust us and who saw our value. And through that, then, we were able to, to win the contract with the consortium and, and start our relationship there. So that was our biggest win because it's not just the potential that we have with the council, it's the potential or, or the, the potential we have in New York with them. These are all national and worldwide employers. So there's just a huge opportunity to help them hire in other geographies and other spheres around the world. So that, that was our biggest, our biggest hard fought battle. And that was definitely like a full team effort which is something that we do from time to time is like 
you know, I will also help out on customer work, even though I'm supposed to be focused on the users when Brett needs me or vice versa. So I think that's also really important is when you need to blurring the lines of what your responsibility or what your role is. Like we're all a family, we're all you know, in the same boat at the end of the day, like I said. So, so I think that also helped when the customer. Yeah. And it helps to have a, a big elephant on your side at the end of the day too. I love that. Yeah. The, the elephants, gazelles, mm -hmm. ants. <laughs> you'll see, you'll see the meme. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely share the meme after this. Okay. So very last thing here. Uh, you mentioned you had a quote that was some inspo for you. So would you be able to share those quotes for us? Yes. Yes. And this is a little insight into my personal life. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna let my freak flag fly. I'm a ultra runner. So I love doing long distance trail marathons and 50 Ks. I did a 40 miler last year. It's a way for me to get all my energy out because I'm inside a seven year old kid that needs a lot of exercise and outdoor activity. Um, and ultra running is a very different sport than marathon running or road running. In road running, it, the fastest person wins. In ultra running, that's not the case. It's the person who slows down the least. So I actually have a sticky on my mirror and it's, it's just a simple quote from a phenomenal athlete and podcaster. His name's Rich Roll. And it says the prize goes to the runner who slows down the least. And for me, that's a metaphor for entrepreneurship. It's a metaphor for life. So much of trail running is just about making sure your fueling strategy is right, making sure you don't actually start off too quick so you still have juice in the tank nine hours later, which some, which some races are. And at the end of the day, I just love that as a metaphor for, again, putting on the blinders and running your own race. And when you see somebody sprinting past you, you might... They, they're running their own race and that's great for them. And I love to cheer people that are sprinting faster than me on. And oftentimes you might catch them at the end. It's the classic like tortoise in the hair, but just a reminder that there's no like finish line. <laughs> it's just how much fun are you having on your journey? And how many beautiful relationships are you building along the way? How many lives can you impact? What's your, it's something that I, say to myself almost every day is what what's 80 year old Kelly looking back and saying to me right mm. now. And that's just a way of staying grounded along with the quote of we're all running our own race. And it's just about waking up and doing the really unsexy work one more day and sticking in the game one more day, finding a cheerleader to cheer you on, on those really tough days, another entrepreneur friend maybe. And yeah, and keeping the right people around you and taking really good care of those people in your life. So that's that's my entrepreneurship. That's beautiful, <laughs> Kelly. I, I love that. And uh, metaphorically, when we're talking about running the entrepreneurship race, I am side by side running with you. But when it comes to running 40 miles in a day, I might have to just be your cheerleader. I also love that for you. I'm like, <laughs> nobody else needs to do this unless you have to. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm starting with a, with a couple miles here and there, but, uh, but we'll get there. Awesome. Thank you. Even thank that. you so much, Kelly, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. And thanks for sharing your insights on partnerships, co-founders, hiring, growth, and that beautiful quote at the end. It was a pleasure to have you be the first guest for our show. Thanks for working out the, the kinks, including the technical ones. We'll, we'll do some editing on the back end and no one will notice. It'll be great. And that will wrap us up for now. But thanks for tuning in and keep learning. Okay. Bye.